Hey everyone, going today I have a warranty call on a Manitowoc ice machine. So we have these cool uh, little probes here that tell us the temperatures. Our compressor is running, as you can see, T3, T4. Uh, they're around room temperature, so we're definitely not doing any pumping from the compressor. And then we come here and see our water level, high, low, they're sensing it. Uh, curtain switch is closed. So that means we need to gauge up. So let's see what's going on here. So as you can see, we have little to no refrigerant here. So let me just turn off the system here and see how much refrigerant's actually in here. We're in a vacuum as you can see, but yeah, 1.4, we don't have much refrigerant here. So let's go put in a trace amount of gas and uh, let's go pump her up with some nitrogen. As you can see, I'm working up on the ladder here. It's gonna be a little bit tricky to um, film this thing, but I will do my best here. Uh, we're on top of uh, one of these testing machines. So let's go ahead and do a leak test. Now there's a lot of braised joints in this. Um, and there's a lot of uh, Armaflex insulation that potentially is gonna be uh, needed to be taken off. So let's go do all the usual suspects here. And let's just take our time. Hopefully we get lucky and get a hit here. Um, the fact that it's empty tells me it's a good size leak but it's hard to say because um, the unit's like over a year old, so it potentially was leaking out slowly over time. Now they did have another company come out and take a look at it, um, and they determined there was no refrigerant in it. But whether they did a leak test or not, I'm not sure. And it's possible they did, and they just said, uh, you know, maybe get the warranty, get ASA warranty company to come out. So we may be looking for something that may be a, a little bit difficult, but Let's just go check out this whole um, piping section here for the condensing unit. And we basically have two of everything, so two TXBs, um, hot gas valves. There's a lot going on here for a leak test. All right, so, so far nothing. And let's just go in here and check our evaporator coil, which, you know, a leak may be in here. It's kind of what I'm leaning towards. But still nothing. All right, so let's keep going here. Let's hit up all our U-bends on the condenser. So far nothing. And then all our expansion valves are inside of uh, all this insulation here. And let's just see if we can get our probe inside the braze joints for the evaporator coil. So far nothing. And let's get the bottom TXV here. Nothing, no luck. Move our way up. We may have to strip down some insulation here. All right, let's go inside the coil here. And I'm getting a hit, but it may be, sometimes you get a false hit when you move the meter too quickly. So let me take that cover off. Let's go hit this up. It's weird that I was getting a hit there. And now it's showing that we're not leaking from there. So it may have just been I moved the meter too quickly, the leak detector. But um, let's just see here. Insanely busy in this area, so people are knocking into my ladder. So I'm just gonna take my time here. Um, so let me just go with the H10. I don't want to rip all this insulation apart. I just want to see if that was a false hit in the coil. I find my H10 the sensitivity is a little bit better than the Detect 3. So let's just go see if we have any better luck with this because it's a lot of insulation that we're gonna have to rip out. And um, yeah, this is gonna be super time consuming. I only get X amount of time to find a leak and repair it. And I think we kind of got something there. It's something. You don't really get the false signal with this. So it's just something in this area that's hidden. And whoa, here we go. It's definitely picking up something there. Look at that. Oh yeah. All right, good on you H10. So we definitely have a leak right there. And as you can see, it, it was picking it up all the way from this far. See, it's still picking it up. Incredible, this leak detector's just been amazing. I've only used it maybe less than 10 times. I'm still learning how to use it, but it's been great for me. So let's just go see if uh, my DTEC 3 will pick it up. And nothing yet. And yeah, it picks it up. You have to be right on it though. So as you can see on a leak test like this, it's really hard to be right on everything. 
Um, let's see if it picks it up from far away. It does not. Okay, so good thing I brought out the H10 because I was going to start stripping down some insulation. But you can see right when we're on the leak, we're getting it, but we have to be bang on it. Okay, and look at this. We have a rub out. Um, looking back on it, maybe it's something I should have noticed right off the bat, but I mean, there's piping everywhere in here. So it's really hard to say, hey, I should have got this one right off the bat. And let's see if we can focus. Look at that little hole right there. So our leak is definitely here, which is good news for a repair. Because it's going to be uh, pretty easy for me to fix this. So that's good news. We just have a rub out. You know, we may have a secondary leak, but who knows. All right, so we had to reschedule this for like 6 in the morning when there's nobody in the store, hallway service, et cetera, et cetera. So we're back now. Um, we're gonna hit this up. Now, I'm gonna lay this on really thick. The reason for that is, if anyone pushes this pipe up ever again, um, we potentially have a rub out. The odds of it leaking are gonna be pretty minimal. So we're just gonna lay this thing on really, really thick. And just make sure, but obviously we're gonna position the pipe in a position where it's gonna be really hard for someone to put it back up into that position. Um, but good to know to look for this kind of stuff. I've never seen this type of leak on this. Mind you, I don't work a ton on these man two lots. I do work on them, but not a crazy, crazy amount. So let's just be sure here. Let's lay it on nice and thick. And I am more than content with that. That's that's on there. That's good. She ain't going to leak. Um, we're good with that. So um, we use 410A on here. So you rarely see me use 410A videos because I don't really do air conditioning. So what 410A means is we're going to have a higher pressure. So that's why I'm pumping up almost to 200, okay? And we'll go over in a little bit why they use 410A on this guy. But it is critically charged, so let's make sure we get our charge in there. And we're going to start our cycle. And what's really cool about this is it times the cycle. You know how many times I forget to start my clock? So look at that, free cycle, 43 seconds in. That, that's a great feature that they've added on here. And our ambient temperature is 82. Probe here, so we can get, because there's two machines here, we're getting 84 Fahrenheit ambient and 113 saturation. All right, so let's just go look at what our head pressure should be. And um, so I actually called Man 2 because I have to update them on the warranty call. And uh, John from Tech Support sent me this chart, which is amazing. Um, they're like slammed with calls right now so he took the time to email me all these manuals so you know shout out to john from antioch thanks a lot for taking the time to do that i know you guys are slammed with all your stuff all right so if we come to the chart here i'm between 80 and 90 so we're going to be checking on these boxes here so let's just go with 80 so 80 gives us 350 so if we go to 350 on our pt chart that gives us 107 okay so based on 107 we can kind of make you know, an educated guess on what Manitou Walk is looking for, their condenser split, okay? So if we go 107 Fahrenheit, okay, less 80 Fahrenheit, what's that going to give us? 27 Fahrenheit. So they're looking more or less for a 27 Fahrenheit split. I'm going to call it a 30 Fahrenheit, okay? So based on what I had, so what did I have? Okay, I had an 84 Fahrenheit. And then we add our 30 Fahrenheit split, and that gives us 114 Fahrenheit. And then I had 113 Fahrenheit, which gives us a 29 Fahrenheit split. So we're in the ballpark of what they want for the chart here. Okay, and then if we even go further, so 90 is 415. So if we can find 415 here. So it's around 119. So that gives us, so based on 119, so let's just actually keep going on this. So the higher you go, the higher the split kind of becomes, which is kind of interesting. But so based on 119 Fahrenheit, less 90 Fahrenheit. And that gives us 29 Fahrenheit. And look at that. Look what we got. So based on this chart, we can kind of determine what the split is and what the engineer and the manufacturer is trying to set up during the cycle. So 29, we're right there. Okay, we had 29 Fahrenheit. Okay, so we're in the area that we want to be. Our head pressure is good. Let's move on. All right, so let's just take a look at our probes here quickly. So T3, T4, you can see they're coming down in temperature before they were room temperature. 
So those are the two expansion valves. Um, they're off by four or five degrees, which is fine in this case. Um, so let's just look here, we're in harvest. So you can see our suction is what I'm looking at, 156 and we're rising. Okay, so I talked earlier about why they're using 410A, we get over that. So why they're using 410A is, see how the pressures are higher? Watch how fast we can harvest now. Okay, usually something like this would take me a minute and a half to two and a half minutes on an ice machine this big, okay? Watch how fast this harvest is gonna go. Look at the water going. Our suction pressure is way higher than if we had 404A. So that's why they like using 410A, because now guess what? If you can eliminate one minute from the harvest time, that's less run time, and then it helps with your Enterstar rating and all that good stuff. But look at this thing go. It's just pumping, okay? We're well above 150 suction. The hot gas valve is open, and look at it. It's just going, she's ready to drop, okay? We're probably getting close to 50 seconds here. And look at it, like butter. Look at that thing just boom, bang. One minute, drop the big, big uh, batch of ice like that. So that's why we like using the 410A on these kind of things, okay? And you can see there the um, the divot it made. Um, I, I have the pipe safely now where, man, someone would have to get a crowbar to wrench this thing up and you would have to really mess up to get this thing back up on there. So I'm confident that repair is good. And now we're gonna go check out our final suction pressure, okay? So we're at 41, but more importantly, the temperature of the coil, we're below zero Fahrenheit, which is great. We're trying to make ice, so you know, it's gotta be below that temperature. And let's see if we can get the final reading here. Okay, I tried to get it earlier, but it went into harvest too quickly. And look at our freeze time. Nine minutes, 47 seconds. Okay, less than 10 minutes. So we're at seven, 7.1, minus 7.1 was our last reading saturation temperature. All right, so let's just go over um, the harvest super quickly. So they also give us a chart for harvest. And during our harvest cycle, we should be between 120 and 170. So we're at 84. So we're between, let's call it 140-ish, okay? And 170, we were way up there. We're at 155. So could you imagine how quickly we can slide the sheet ice off the coil? Okay, that's why they like using the 410A. For this reason, for the harvest, we can really bump up that suction pressure during harvest. Okay, so we're within the range there. That's great. Now the final thing is the suction pressure. 75 to 38. So our suction pressure, our suction pressure ended out at 39 PSI. So we're off by one, we're off by one PSI, which equaled minus seven Fahrenheit. Okay, so if we go look up 38, and let's see if this chart gets accurate enough. So if we go look up 38, it gives us minus eight. Okay, so we're off by one degree, okay, but we're still off. So what's the reason why we did not get minus eight Fahrenheit, okay? And all that has to do with is the ice, ice thickness probe, okay? If I set this ice thickness probe to go for even like probably 20 seconds longer, I will get that minus seven Fahrenheit. So this is just showing you the low end, the 38. We're at 39, we're fine. If we want the ice thicker, we're definitely going to get down to 38 because you saw as it was coming down, like the... The saturation temperature was dropping so quickly, okay? So we're safe here at minus seven, okay? So it's it's really cool to see these kind of charts and then applying them and then seeing how everything works. And the last thing we wanna look at is our freeze time. And that one's important too, because if we gotta make ice in nine minutes and it's taking us 15 minutes, well, the question is how long should it take? Well, let's go look at our temperature coming in is probably 85, so we're in this zone right here. I don't know the water temperature, but more or less we're looking for nine minutes to 11 minutes, somewhere in there. And it also depends on the ice thickness. So that's why there's a range, one minute range between these. Okay, we dropped our ice right at 10 minutes. So look at that, we're right in the range here. Okay, 10.5 is the high end, 8.5 is the low end. So we're making ice in the correct amount of time. Okay, our harvest is going the correct amount of time. And how do we know that? Well, look at this, harvest time. One minute to two and a half minutes. We were exactly one minute, okay? So going to 410A has shaved a lot of time off making ice. And I, I know you're thinking, what's one minute? When you're making like hundreds of batches, one minute's a big thing for the Enderstar rating, okay? So we are within our range everywhere here. Harvest times, we are good. Uh, freeze time, we are good. Our suction pressure, 
perfect. Discharge pressure, perfect. And then our suction pressure during harvest was perfect. Okay, so it's really important to use these charts. Um, and I know the hold times are a little bit long at the moment when you're calling in, but you know, while you're on hold, pull up this chart. And if you can make sense of it, well, guess what? I mean, like you can hang up the phone, okay? And, um, and just the importance I've been stressing to everyone, you know, learn the equipment, read the service manuals, you know, take a chance at the equipment before calling tech support, educate yourself on the equipment and everything becomes easier and easier. I'm by no means a Manitou walk ice machine expert, but literally based on this chart that he sent me and all the troubleshooting, like I was able to figure everything out with, you know, this, my PT chart and I didn't need a stopwatch. Like I love that feature, how they have the probes. So the T1 through T4 probes, but I love the feature that they're timing the freeze cycle now. So that's just great little things that they've integrated in these new machines that are just going to make our life a lot easier.